Poltanese, Beholder of Ocean, by Lord Dunsany, originally published in Irish Homestead, Christmas, 1908, narrated by Tom Trisse. Toldiz, Mondath, Arizim, these are the inner lands, the lands whose sentinels upon the borders do not behold the sea. Beyond them, to the east, there lies a desert, for ever untroubled by man. All yellow it is, and spotted with shadows of stones, and death is in it, like a leopard lying in the sun. To the south they are bounded by magic, to the west by a mountain, and to the north by the voice and anger of the polar wind. Like a great wall is the mountain to the west. It comes up out of the distance and goes down into the distance again, and it is named Poltanese, beholder of ocean. To the northward red rocks, smooth and bare of soil, and without any speck of moss or herbage, slope up to the very lips of the polar wind, and there is nothing else there but the noise of his anger. Very peaceful are the inner lands, and very fair are their cities, and there is no war among them but quiet and ease, and they have no enemy but age, for thirst and fever lie sunning themselves out in the mid-desert and never prowl into the inner lands, and the ghouls and ghosts, whose highway is the night, are kept in the south by the boundary of magic. And very small are all their pleasant cities, and all men are known to one another therein, and bless one another by name as they meet in the streets. And they have a broad green way in every city that comes in out of some vale or wood or downland, and wanders in and out about the city between the houses and across the streets, and the people walk along it, never at all, but every year at her appointed time spring walks along it from the flowery lands, causing the anemone to bloom on the green way, and all the early joys of hidden woods, or deep secluded vales, or triumphant downlands, whose heads lift up so proudly, far up, aloof from cities. Sometimes wagoners or shepherds walk along this way, they that have come into the city from over cloudy ridges, and the townsmen hinder them not, for there is a tread that troubleth the grass, and a tread that troubleth it not, and each man in his own heart knoweth which tread he hath, and in the sunlit spaces of the weald, and in the world's dark places, afar from the music of cities and from the dance of the cities afar. They make there the music of the country places and dance the country dance. Amiable, near and friendly appears to these men the sun, and as he is genial to them and tends their younger vines, so they are kind to the little woodland things and any rumour of the fairies or old legend and when the light of some little distant city makes a slight flush upon the edge of the sky, and the happy golden windows of the homesteads stare gleaming into the dark, then the old and holy figure of romance, cloaked even to the face, comes down out of hilly woodlands and bids dark shadows to rise and dance, and sends the forest creatures forth to prowl, and lights in a moment in her bower of grass the little glow-worm's lamp, and brings a hush down over the grey lands, and out of it rises faintly on far-off hills the voice of a lute. There are not in the world lands more prosperous and happy than Toldis, Mondath, Azarim. From these three little kingdoms that are named the inner lands, the young men stole constantly away. One by one they went, and no one knew why they went, save that they had a longing to behold the sea. Of this longing they spoke little, 
but a young man would become silent for a few days, and then, one morning very early, he would slip away and slowly climb Paul knees's difficult slope, and having attained the top, pass over and never return. A few stayed behind in the inner lands and became old men, but none that ever climbed Poltonese knees from the very earliest times had ever come back again. Many had gone up Poltonese knees sworn to return. Once a king sent all his courtiers, one by one, to report the mystery to him, and then went himself. None ever returned. Now, it was the want of the folk of the inner lands to worship rumours and legends of the sea, and all that their prophets discovered of the sea was writ in a sacred book, and with deep devotion on days of festival or mourning, read in the temples by the priests. Now, all their temples lay open to the west, resting upon pillars, that the breeze from the sea might enter them, and they lay open on pillars to the east, that the breezes of the sea might not be hindered, but pass onward wherever the sea list. And this is the legend that they had of the sea, whom none in the inner lands had ever beholden. They say that the sea is a river heading towards Hercules, and they say that he touches against the edge of the world, and that Poltonese looks upon him. They say that all the worlds of heaven go bobbing on this river and are swept down with the stream, and that infinity is thick and furry with forest through which the river in its course sweeps on with all the worlds of heaven. Among the colossal trunks of those dark trees, the smallest fronds of whose branches are many nights, there walk the gods, and whenever its thirst, glowing in space like a great sun, comes upon the beast. The tiger of the gods creeps down to the river to drink, and the tiger of the gods drinks his fill loudly, whelming worlds the while, and the level of the river sinks between its banks ere the beast's thirst is quenched and ceases to glow like a sun. And many worlds thereby are heaped up dry and stranded, and the gods walk not among them evermore, because they are hard to their feet. These are the worlds that have no destiny, whose people know no god, and the river sweeps onwards ever. And the name of the river is Oriathan, but men call it Ocean. This is the lower faith of the inner lands, and there is a higher faith which is not told to all. According to the higher faith of the inner lands, the river Oriathon sweeps on through the forests of infinity and all at once falls roaring over an edge, whence time has long ago recalled his hours to fight in his war with the gods, and falls unlit by the flash of nights and days, with his flood unmeasured by miles into the deeps of nothing. Now as the centuries went by, and the one way by which a man could climb Poltanese became worn with feet, more and more men surmounted it, not to return. And still they knew not in the inner lands upon what mystery Poltanese looked. For on a still day and windless, while men walked happily about their beautiful street or tended flocks in the country, Suddenly the west wind would bestir himself and come in from the sea, and he would come cloaked and grey and mournful, and carry to someone the hungry cry of the sea calling out for bones of men. And he that heard it would move restlessly for some hours, and at last would rise suddenly irresistibly up, setting his face to Poltanese, and would say, as is the custom of those lands when men part briefly, till a man's heart remembereth, which means, farewell for a while. But those that loved him, seeing his eyes on Poltanese, would answer sadly, till the gods forget, which means, farewell. 
Now the king of Arizim had a daughter who played with the wild wood flowers and with the fountains in her father's court and with the little blue heaven birds that came to her doorway in the winter to shelter from the snow. And she was more beautiful than the wild wood flowers or than all the fountains in her father's court or than the blue heaven birds in their full winter plumage when they shelter from the snow. The old wise kings of Mondath and of Toldiz saw her once as she went lightly down the little paths of her garden, and turning their gaze into the mists of thought, pondered the destiny of their inner lands, and they watched her closely by the stately flowers and standing alone in the sunlight, and passing and repassing the strutting purple birds that the king's fowlers had brought from Asagihon. When she was of the age of fifteen years, the king of Mondath called a council of kings, and there met with him the kings of Toldiz and Arizim. And the king of Mondath in his council said, The call of the unappeased and hungry sea and at the word sea the three kings bowed their heads, lures every year out of our happy kingdoms more and more of our men, and still we know not the mystery of the sea, and no devised oath has brought one man back. Now thy daughter, Arizim, is lovelier than the sunlight, and lovelier than those stately flowers of thine that stand so tall in her garden, and hath more grace and beauty than those strange birds that the venturous fowlers bring in creaking wagons out of Asagihon, whose feathers are alternate purple and white. Now, he that shall love thy daughter, Hilnerik, whoever he shall be, is the man to climb Poltanis and return, as none hath ever before, and tell us upon what Poltanis looks for it may be that thy daughter is more beautiful than the sea. Then from his seat of council arose the king of Arizim. He said, I fear that thou hast spoken blasphemy against the sea, and I have a dread that ill will come of it. Indeed, I had not thought she was so fair. It is such a short while ago that she was quite a small child with her hair still unkempt and not yet attired in the manner of princesses, and she would go up into the wild woods unattended and come back with her robes unseemly and all torn, and would not take reproof with humble spirit, but make grimaces even in my marble court all set about with fountains. Then said the king of Toldiz, let us watch more closely, and let us see the Princess Hilnerik in the season of the orchard bloom, when the great birds go by that know the sea, to rest in our inland places. And if she be more beautiful than the sunrise over our folded kingdoms when all the orchards bloom, it may be that she is more beautiful than the sea. And the king of Arism said, I fear this is terrible blasphemy yet will I do as you have decided in council. And the season of the orchard bloom appeared. One night the king of Arizim called his daughter forth on to his outer balcony of marble, and the moon was rising huge and round and holy over dark woods, and all the fountains were singing to the night, and the moon touched the marble palace gables, and they glowed in the land and the moon touched the heads of all the fountains, and the grey columns broke into fairy lights, and the moon left the dark ways of the forest, and lit the whole white palace and its fountains, and shone on the forehead of the princess, and the palace of Arizim glowed afar, and the fountains became columns of gleaming jewels and song, and the moon made a music at his rising, but it fell a little short of mortal ears. And Hilnerik stood there, wondering, clad in white, with the moonlight shining on her forehead, and watching her from the shadows on the terrace, stood the kings of Mondath and Toldiz. They said, She is more beautiful than the moonrise. And on another day,
the king of Arizim, bade his daughter forth at dawn, and they stood again upon the balcony, and the sun came up over a world of orchards, and the sea mists went back over Poltanees to the sea. Little wild voices arose in all the thickets, the voices of the fountains began to die, and the song arose in all the marble temples of the birds that are sacred to the sea. And Hilnerick stood there, still glowing with dreams of heaven. She is more beautiful, said the kings, than mourning. Yet one more trial they made of Hilnerick's beauty, for they watched her on the terraces at sunset, ere the petals of the orchards had fallen, and all along the edge of neighbouring woods the rhododendron was blooming with azalea. And the sun went down under craggy Portonese, and the sea mist poured over his summit inland, and the marble temples stood up clear in the evening, but films of twilight were drawn between the mountain and the city. Then from the temple ledges and eaves of palaces the bats fell headlong downwards, then spread their wings and floated up and down through darkening ways. Lights came blinking out in golden windows, men cloaked themselves against the grey sea mist, the sound of small songs arose, and the face of Hilnerick became a resting place for mysteries and dreams. Than all these things, said the kings, she is more lovely. But who can say whether she is lovelier than the sea? Prone in a rhododendron thicket at the edge of the palace lawns, a hunter had waited since the sun went down. Near to him was a deep pool where the hyacinths grew, and strange flowers floated upon it with broad leaves, and there the great bull Garriax came down to drink by starlight, and, waiting there for the Garriax to come, he saw the white form of the princess leaning on her balcony. Before the stars shone out, or the bulls came down to drink, he left his lurking place and moved closer to the palace to see more nearly the princess. The palace lawns were full of untrodden dew, and everything was still when he came across them, holding his great spear. In the farthest corner of the terraces the three old kings were discussing the beauty of Hilnerick and the destiny of the inner lands. Moving lightly, with the hunter's tread, the watcher by the pool came very near, even in the still evening, before the princess saw him. When he saw her closely, he exclaimed suddenly, "'She must be more beautiful than the sea!' Then the princess turned and saw his garb and his great spear. She knew that he was a hunter of Garriax. Then the three kings heard the young man exclaim. They said softly to one another, This must be the man. Then they revealed themselves to him and spoke to him to try him. They said, Sir, you have spoken blasphemy against the sea. And the young man muttered, She is more beautiful than the sea. And the kings said, We are older than you, and wiser, and know that nothing is more beautiful than the sea. And the young man took off the gear of his head, and became downcast, and knew that he spake with kings. Yet he answered, By this spear she is more beautiful than the sea. And all the while the princess stared at him, knowing him to be a hunter of Garriax. Then the king of Arizim said to the watcher by the pool, If thou wilt go up to Poltanese and come back, as none have come, and report to us what lure or magic is in the sea, we will pardon thy blasphemy, and thou shalt have the princess to wife, and sit among the council of the kings. And gladly thereunto the young man consented, and the princess spoke to him, and asked him his name, and he told her that his name was Athelvok, and great joy arose in him at the sound of her voice, 
and to the three kings he promised to set out on the third day to scale the slope of Poltanese, and to return again, and this was the oath by which they bound him to return. I swear by the sea that bears the worlds away, by the river of Oriathon, which men call ocean, and by the gods and their tiger, and by the doom of the worlds, that I will return again to the inner lands, having beheld the sea. And that oath he swore with solemnity that very night in one of the temples of the sea. But the three kings trusted more to the beauty of Hilnerick even than to the power of the oath. The next day Athelvok came to the palace of Arizim with the morning, over the fields to the east, and out of the country of Toldes, and Hilnerick came out along her balcony and met him on the terraces. And she asked him if he had ever slain a Gariac, and he said that he had slain three, and then he told her how he had killed his first down by the pool in the wood. For he had taken his father's spear, and got down to the edge of the pool, and had lain under the azaleas there waiting for the stars to shine, by whose first light the Gariacs go to the pools to drink, and he had gone too early, and had had long to wait, and the passing hours seemed longer than they were. And all the birds came in that home at night, and the bat was abroad, and the hour of the duck went by, and still no Gariac came down to the pool. And Athelvok felt sure that none would come, and just as this grew to a certainty in his mind, the thicket parted noiselessly and a huge bull Gariac stood facing him on the edge of the water, and his great horns swept out sideways from his head, and at the ends curved upwards, and were four strides in width from tip to tip. And he had not seen Athelvok, for the great bull was on the far side of the little pool, and Athelvok could not creep round to him for fear of meeting the wind, for the Gariacs, who can see little in the dark forests, rely on hearing and smell. But he devised swiftly in his mind, while the bull stood there with head erect just twenty strides from him across the water. And the bull sniffed the wind cautiously and listened, then lowered its great head down to the pool and drank. At that instant, Athelvok leapt into the water, and shot forward through its weedy depths among the stems of the strange flowers that floated upon broad leaves on the surface. And Athelvok kept his spear out straight before him, and the fingers of his left hand he held rigid and straight, not pointing upwards, and so did not come to the surface, but was carried onward by the strength of his spring, and passed unentangled through the stems of the flowers. When Athelvok jumped into the water, the bull must have thrown his head up, startled at the splash. Then he would have listened, and have sniffed the air, and neither hearing nor scenting any danger, he must have remained rigid for some moments, for it was in that attitude that Athelvok found him as he emerged breathless at his feet. And striking at once, Athelvok drove the spear into his throat before the head and the terrible horns came down. But Athelvok had clung to one of the great horns, and had been carried at terrible speed through the rhododendron bushes, until the Gariac fell, but rose at once again, and died standing up, still struggling, drowned in its own blood. But to Hilnerick, listening, it was as though one of the heroes of old time had come back again in the full glory of his legendary youth. And long time they went up and down the terraces, saying those things which were said before and since, and which lips shall yet be made to say again. And above them stood Poltarnes beholding the sea. And the day came when Athelvok should go. And Hilnerick said to him, Will you not indeed most surely come back again, having just looked over the summit of Poltanese? 
Athelvok answered, I will indeed come back, for thy voice is more beautiful than the hymn of the priests when they chant and praise the sea. And though many tributary seas ran down into Ariathon, and he and all the others poured their beauty into one pool below me, yet would I return, swearing that thou wert fairer than they. Alnhilnerik answered, The wisdom of my heart tells me, or old knowledge, or prophecy, or some strange law, that I shall never hear thy voice again. And for this... I give thee my forgiveness. But he, repeating the oath that he had sworn, set out, looking often backwards until the slope became too steep and his face was set to the rock. It was in the morning that he started, and he climbed all the day with little rest, where every foothold was smooth with many feet. Before he reached the top, the sun disappeared from him, and darker and darker grew the inner lands. Then he pushed on, so as to see before dark whatever thing Potanese had to show. The dusk was deep over the inner lands, and the lights of cities twinkled through the sea mist when he came to Potanese's summit, and the sun before him was not yet gone from the sky. And there below him was the old wrinkled sea, smiling and murmuring song. And he nursed little ships with gleaming sails, and in his hands were old regretted wrecks, and masts all studded over with golden nails that he had rent in anger out of beautiful galleons. And the glory of the sun was among the surges as they brought driftwood out of isles of spice, tossing their golden heads. And the grey currents crept away to the south like companionless serpents that love something afar with a restless deadly love. And the whole plain of water glittering with late sunlight, and the surges and the currents and the white sails of ships were all together like the face of a strange new god that has looked a man for the first time in the eyes at the moment of his death. And Athelvok, looking on the wonderful sea, knew why it was that the dead never return, for there is something that the dead feel and know, and the living would never understand, even though the dead should come and speak to them about it. And there was the sea, smiling at him, glad with the glory of the sun. And there was a haven there for homing ships, and a sunlit city stood upon its marge, and people walked about the streets of it clad in the unimagined merchandise of far sea-bordering lands. An easy slope of loose crumbled rock went from the top of Portanis to the shore of the sea. For a long while Athelvok stood there regretfully, knowing that there had come something into his soul that no one in the inner lands could understand, where the thoughts of their minds had gone no farther than the three little kingdoms. Then, looking long upon the wandering ships and the marvellous merchandise from alien lands and the unknown colour that wreathed the brows of the sea, he turned his face to the darkness and the inner lands, at that moment the sea sang a dirge at sunset for all the harm that he had done in anger, and all the ruin wrought on adventurous ships, and there were tears in the voice of the Turinus Sea, for he had loved the galleons that he had overwhelmed, and he called all men to him, and all living things that he might make amends, because he had loved the bones that he had strewn afar. And Athelvok turned, and set one foot upon the crumbled slope, and then another, and walked a little way to be nearer to the sea. And then a dream came upon him, and he felt that men had wronged the lovely sea, because he had been angry a little, because he had been sometimes cruel. He felt that there was trouble among the tides of the sea, because he had loved the galleons who were dead. Still he walked on, and the crumbled stones rolled with him, 
and just as the twilight faded and a star appeared, he came to the golden shore and walked on till the surges were about his knees, and he heard the prayer-like blessings of the sea. Long he stood thus, while the stars came out above him and shone again in the surges. More stars came wheeling in their courses up from the sea, lights twinkled out through all the haven city, lanterns were slung from the ships, the purple night burned on, and earth, to the eyes of the gods as they sat afar, glowed as if with one flame. Then Athelvok went into the haven city. There he met many who had left the inner lands before him. None of them wished to return to the people who had not seen the sea. Many of them had forgotten the three little kingdoms, and it was rumoured that one man, who had once tried to return, had found the shifting crumbled slope impossible to climb. Hilnerick never married, but her dowry was set aside to build a temple wherein men cursed the ocean. Once every year, with solemn rite and ceremony, they curse the tides of the sea, and the moon looks in and hates them. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Comment, like, and do all the things the algorithm needs.